name is Kathleen Miles, and I'm the executive editor of Noema Magazine. Welcome to our discussion on Has Hysteria Conquered America? Presented in partnership with Zocalo Public Square. Noema, which is published by the Bear Bruin Institute, is a magazine exploring the transformations sweeping our world, from artificial intelligence and the climate crisis to the future of democracy and capitalism. Noema Magazine seeks a deeper understanding of the most pressing challenges of the 21st century. Subscribe to our print edition and find all our digital content at noemamag.com. Today, we are joined by essayist and novelist Pankaj Mishra, who is on the Noema editorial board and is the author, most recently, of Bland Fanatics, Liberals, Race, and Empire. We will discuss why American discourse, particularly around government and elections, is full of conspiracy theories, paranoia, xenophobia, and overheated denunciations. Pankaj will explore, to put it bluntly, whether the United States has lost its political mind. And now I'd like to hand it off to Moira Shori, the Executive Director of Zocalo Public Square. Thank you, Kathleen. I'm Moira Shori. Welcome to Zocalo Public Square. At Zocalo, our mission is to connect people to ideas and to one another. Everything we do is free and everyone is welcome. We publish original writing and convene events like the one we're watching today. Find out more on our website, zocalopublicsquare.org. Today's discussion will cover many topics that Pankaj Mishra has written about. When Pankaj was last in Los Angeles, we hosted him at a sold out Zocalo event in downtown. But today he is joining us from his home in London. We will be restreaming this event in a few hours to reach our audiences in Europe and Asia. And now I'd like to introduce Ronald Brownstein, senior editor of The Atlantic. He's also a political analyst for CNN and a two-time Pulitzer Prize finalist for political reporting. Over to you, Ron. Hello, and thank you, Moira. I'm excited to speak today with Pankaj Mishra, who is an SAS and writer of both fiction and nonfiction books, and really one of the most uh, prolific and insightful commentators uh, on the modern life and modern, the modern world. He's a columnist for Bloomberg Opinion. His political writing also appears frequently in the New York Times, the New York Review of Books, The Guardian, The New Yorker, and many other publications. His most recent book is Bland Fanatics, Liberals, Race, and Empire, a collection of essays examining the current political and intellectual culture of the United States and the West. Joining me, join me in welcoming Pankaj. Thank you for being with us this afternoon at, at Zocalo. Um, can thank I start, you for having me on. Oh yeah, can I just, it's, it's really a, a privilege for all of us. Um, the framing question, has hysteria conquered America? From where you sit, what does the answer look like? Well, I think the answer has been yes, hasn't it? For, for some time at least, um, ever since Trump arrived. I mean, I think there was hysteria before but it didn't quite manifest itself in this incredibly dramatic and sometimes violent way. Um, and I think in a way, you know, he might have made it more visible as it were. Uh, in some ways it might be a good thing because we can at least acknowledge it, we can diagnose it, and perhaps we can, you know, try and start thinking about ways to go beyond it. You know, there was a uh, there was an interview uh, after the first debate, first presidential debate here, uh, when Trump uh, refused to condemn white nationalists and kind of gave this shout out to the Proud Boys, a kind of you know far right white supremacist group. Uh, the L.A. Times, our, our our local paper, went out and interviewed people in different cities, and they interviewed a African American man in Atlanta who said, um, if it they asked him if that bothered him. And he said, no, he said, every white president has been a racist, at least with Trump, he's honest about it. Um, that was kind of an extreme response, but there is a sense in which some of these issues that, were, that we may have thought were behind us uh, are now being debated directly uh, in the marquee, at the marquee. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think you know, one of the arguments I try to make in this book and other pieces that I've done is that one reason why we are unable to look at our world clearly is because we are too influenced by a certain ideology of progress, of continuous, mm -hmm. uh, irreversible improvement. And uh, once we start believing in that, it's, 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 it's actually quite a bit like, you know, 
what people used to believe in, in communist states, uh, that we're all progressing, it's all developing, it's all th things are all working out extremely well. Except that in this context, it's not just the state, it's not just the government that is promoting this ideology, it's you know, various parts of the establishment, it's the media, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's the think tanks. And if enough number of people start believing in it, it'll become very difficult to identify various pathologies and problems that have crept into your society that have actually been there for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And I think in that sense, you know, I've written about this, um, Trump has been welcome in at least one aspect, you know, uh, I, can, I can argue that at least, uh, which is that he's forced us, he's forced us to confront many of these problems that we either skated over or ignored or suppressed in the past. And I think they're now out there and we just have to face up to them. You know, I think the example that you just gave is, is very illuminating. I mean, I had friends from America belonging to minority groups who were very convinced, you know, when no one was that Trump is gonna win. Um, they just thought, you know, there is no way uh, he, can be, he can be defeated given, they, they could just sense that there was a groundswell of support for him. Um, so they were on to something that other people were not. I mean, the whole sort of, you know, infrastructure of punditry, all the mm -hmm. entire, mainstream pundits, columnists, uh, they all were one in thinking that there is no way he can win, but there were people out there who, who said that something was changing, something was different. Uh, as, you know, as a card-carrying member of that mainstream pundit punditocracy, I can say that the, the, the person who I encountered during 2016, who was the most convinced throughout that, that Trump could win was an African-American pollster named Cornell Belcher, uh, who said correctly, it isn't that uh, a majority of white, he, she said, he, he said basically, even if a majority of white voters considered him a racist, that would not be disqualifying for as many voters as someone like me probably thought in 2016. There are people who said, yeah, he's a racist and I'll vote for him anyway. You know, yeah. um, now let me ask you this. When, when you look at what, you're, what, we're, what we're seeing in America, the, the kind of divisions, the superheated style of politics with conspiracy theories flourishing, more open appeals to racism and xenophobia from Trump than we've seen from anybody at the national level since Wallace in 68, uh, really unconcealed calls for violence, uh, misinformation and disinformation spreading on social media. How does that look to you in a global perspective? I mean, to what extent is what we are, you know, the kind of the, the crack up uh, of our politics that we've been witnessing in America unique to the US? And to what extent is it part of a larger current that is, is affecting other countries as well? I mean, there are obviously certain things that are unique to America since it's a, you know, it's a, it's a democracy with proper institutions even if they're malfunctioning right now, uh, the institutions nevertheless exist. Uh, but I think it is safe to say that America has joined a larger historical trend, you know, that we've seen in many different parts of the world for a very long time in post-colonial Asia and Africa, countries falling apart or countries suffering from, this is a phrase I use in Age of Anger, kind of low intensity civil war. Mm -hmm. A civil war that doesn't actually erupt in open naked violence but nevertheless makes it impossible for society and the state to function. Um, and I think we've seen this in, in many different parts of the world, uh, but again, we really couldn't see them clearly or we couldn't really relate them to the possibility that something like that might also happen in, in, in Britain and the United States, because we were too quick to come up with explanations uh, that were self-flattering, you know, if there's something wrong in Algeria, if something, there's something wrong in Pakistan, it's because of a particular culture, it's a particular way of doing things, it's because of Islam or it's because the way they don't really, uh, these people are not compatible in their worldviews with democracy or, or, or capitalism. And I think we can, we can see today that these problems, these pathologies, uh, these divisions are simply not unique to underdeveloped parts of the world, economically underdeveloped parts of the world, that they can actually happen in, in some of the richest countries of the world. And in, in this case, the richest and the most powerful country in the world. So I think it's very important to keep that global perspective in mind um, and, and to not again sort of start out a narrative of American exceptionalism there, because we have seen figures like Donald Trump before. I mean, you know, I've come to this subject not through the American experience or not through the British experience, but through the experience of India, supposedly yeah. the world's largest democracy. It was there where you could see that democratic institutions were, 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 were dysfunctional and the political culture was changing very dramatically. 
a whole culture of hatred, of division, of, of, of acrimony was emerging and many people were happily subscribing to it and looking for a demagogue or a leader who could sort of, you know, basically protect their rights or, or at least seem to be protecting their rights. And, you know, so I think that from with that kind of training, uh, what has happened in America hasn't come as a huge surprise. I mean, I think it has come as a surprise to people who thought this could never happen here, mm -hmm. that this was something uh, very peculiar to particular countries and cultures. You know, I, I want to talk about the deep roots of that, which, uh, which you, which you uh, uh, explicate, I think, quite in a quite fascinating way uh, in the age of anger, especially. Uh, but I want to talk about the current book uh, uh, first. Um, the title of your new, your book, Bland Fanatics, uh, seems a contradiction in terms, fanatics or bland. What's the history of the phrase and what does it mean to you in the contemporary context? Well, the phrase I take from uh, an American, very famous American uh, liberal theologian, uh, Ryan Niebuhr, and- Barack Obama's favorite theologian. Absolutely. Um, although Barack Obama has, I think, a selective understanding of um, what he actually said and wrote. But nevertheless, I think what he was objecting to when he used that phrase were people in the United States and elsewhere who assumed that they had arrived at a particular summit of human achievement and that other countries or other cultures should also arrive there. And these were the methods, these were the prescriptions that they needed in order to make that particular journey. Uh, so he was objecting to this very hubristic idea that first of all, this particular summit that we've arrived at is the only available summit or is the only away, available way of organizing your politics and your economy. And that uh, actually the reason why we arrived there is due far more to certain historical accidents than to you know, great efforts of our own. Um, so in, 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 there were multiple ways in which, in which he was objecting to this hubristic ideology that emerged during the Cold War. And I think it's very useful for, for my purpose because I think it connects uh, what was happening in the 1950s to what has been happening since the end of the Cold War, particularly mm -hmm. intensely, the sort of whole notion that the rest of the world can become like us. And that all we have to do is train particular people or maybe sometimes even go to war uh, to persuade that our way of life is best and they sh they, 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 they'll be better off if they adopt it as soon as possible. Um, and the argument of the book is that this kind of thinking, which is very uh, unself-critical, it doesn't really stop to challenge itself. It resembles far too much the ideology that liberalism was opposing, supposedly opposing all through the Cold War, which is mm -hmm. communism, the idea of global revolution or global transformation, uh, if not through revolution, through, through, through gradual change, through the diffusion of capitalism and technology, uh, and that, that these are uh, very hubristic notions. And I think today we can very clearly see, but what I was trying to do in the book, and you know, these, this, this, this book actually consists of essays that I began to write in the late 2000s, uh, before the financial crisis, uh, but very much you know, actually you know, out of the experience of the, the calamitous Iraq war, uh, and thinking the war on terror has failed so calamitously, and then you have the financial crisis, uh, and then you have you know the stirrings of uh, political disaffection, whether it's the Tea Party movement or, or the Occupy. Uh, they were all signs that this this sort of Cold War ideology of liberalism, which had sort of survived and become even more powerful after the collapse of communism, uh, was really in many ways an ideological dead end, and that uh, it was seriously misleading us, and that we need to rethink this whole narrative of uh, Cold War liberalism and then also challenge it and come up with better ideas and better solutions. So I think it's, it's in, in that sense, it's a, it's a defensive book because I'm actually pushing back against the dominant ideology of the time. It is no longer dominant. I it's say. been, of course, you know, replaced by, it's been uh, un, un, uh, basically unseated by, by the far right today. Yeah. Uh, so today it's very much on the defensive. Uh, but when I was writing it, it was very much dominant. You know, in, in many different points in your writing, both in Blind Fanatics and Age of Anger, you come back to a quote from another icon of kind of Cold War liberalism, Conor Cruz O'Brien. And you quote him on a trip to Africa in the 1960s uh, when he was, I think, surprised to see how many local 
uh, leaders and, and individuals that he ran into viewed Western liberalism, quote, uh, as the, quote, ingratiating moral mask, which a toughly acquisitive society wears before the world it robs. Uh, and you quote that, I think, at you know, different points in different essays and, and also in the age of, reason, in the age of anger. Um, that's your view too, is it not? Well, I think I have a slightly more complicated view, uh, okay. which is that you know, liberalism itself as a set of ideas about individual freedom, autonomy, tolerance, uh, if this is what liberalism claims to be, then we should all be advancing its aims. But I think uh, one should be very careful of the kind of arrogance that creeps into people who are in positions of power and influence and can suddenly stop actually reckoning with the consequences of their actions. So in other words, what I'm really objecting to is the way people have used you know, a relatively unobjectionable ideology and use it to advance their own power and interests. Um, I mean, I think there is a very good case to be made for realizing the aims of liberalism, liberalism as in a set of ideas uh, essentially meant to you know, improve the human condition. Mm -hmm. But the way the liberals have gone about it, it's been really disastrous. Um, so that is why, you know, it's not just Conor Cruz O'Brien who was saying these things. I mean, Nadine Godimer, there's a famous interview of hers with the London Times, uh, great novelist, um, who said, you know, she was, a, she was a white South African and she was up against it in white South Africa. And she said, please don't call me a liberal. I think the interviewer was doing that. And it's a dirty word for me. I'm actually a South African radical. Uh, because liberals, she could see in her context, were so given to, so vulnerable to hypocrisy and to double talk and to compromise. And this is someone, someone like her in that position simply could not accept. So I think there was a lot of strong reaction to people back in the 60s and 70s in those countries, the countries that Conor Cruz O'Brien was traveling through and in large places in Asia and Africa. I mean, a lot of the anti-colonial activists who uh, won independence for their countries, uh, they did not call themselves liberal because liberal for them was also a dirty word. Uh, yeah. it, to them was too complicit with imperialism. Liberals were too complicit in their, in their vision. When you talked about the global civil war in, in the age of anger, and you, you, you mentioned it before, define that, a little, define that a little further. I mean, who are the combatants? What are the stakes? What are the, what are the, what are the contending viewpoints? And, and do, you, do you still think that, is, uh, that, is, um, that the battle lines are the same as they were when you, when you wrote the age of anger, or are they shifting? I think the battle lines are constantly shifting um, because I think there are new factors emerging all the time, the pandemic being, being, being uh, one of them. Um, but I think the broader analysis was that, uh, going back to the beginning, the modern world starts out with uh, contradictory promises. One is a promise of equality uh, and, and individual dignity. And uh, that promise is how the modern world begins. But then there is this other promise that we will realize uh, individual uh, uh, power and, 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 and national power through capitalism. Mm -hmm. And that's when the contradictions start becoming sharper and sharper because capitalism tends to generate inequality. And that creates more and more disaffection uh, and it starts to work against democracy or democratic uh, ideals. Now, this situation can be contained and has been contained by ruling classes in the past by you know, creating social states, creating social welfare states, where you accommodate you know, the demands of people who are being exploited, the working classes. And then of course, you know, as, as, as economies become more complex, various other people within society who feel exploited or marginalized, you, know, you start on a kind of program of gradual inclusion. Mm -hmm. What happened in the last 20, 30 years was that the promise of equality went truly global. You know, and that was a, that was a democratic revolution. I think what happened, yeah. absolutely. It was the, the sort of the dream of individual dignity, individual equality, 
uh, the fact that, you know, whether you're in India or China, uh, you should be identified, you sh your rights should be respected. Uh, that revolution, which is in many ways a necessary revolution, coincided with this other revolution, which was the revolution of neoliberal capitalism, mm -hmm. where by the promise of equality got entangled with the promise of prosperity. And in that particular, this particular you know, conflict that emerged in many, in many different parts, it became clear after a while that there were certain people who were getting more and more, more, and more prosperous mm -hmm. and other people just failing to make it. And they were finding themselves up against all kinds of institutional hurdles uh, when it came to achieving prosperity, where certain people already had it made and that the idea of meritocracy was a fraud and that the whole idea of making it with, the, you know, with sheer effort, with your talent, that idea was itself deceptive. Uh, so that realization began to sink in at the same time as this you know, urge for democratic equality got stronger. And so one reason why we see these eruptions of uh, disaffection, of, of militancy all over the world is because uh, the democratic idea has gone universal and the way of realizing the democratic idea, which was, okay, we'll have you know, uh, faster growth, we'll have economies where prosperity becomes a norm. That idea has been completely proven to be false. And, okay, and can, I, can I jump in there? Do you, you know, the, the eruptions that, that are occurring around the world, uh, do you think so many societies are in turmoil primarily because of economic inequality or primarily because of political leaders who are uh, pointing more of their people toward racial and ethnic differences? Or do you see that as a false choice that essentially the two are connected? I mean, what, what is driving the instability fundamentally? Is it inequality or racial resentment? Or both? I don't think there's one fundamental cause, I mean, to anything for that matter. Yeah. You know, there are always many things working together, a uh, set of interlocking, interlocking factors. Once you start, I mean, you know, I've given you a very broad explanation. Yeah. Once you start breaking it down and looking at individual countries, then you're looking at groups of people, classes, uh, in, in the case of India, particular castes, that are fighting to preserve their interests. And they're happy to subscribe to any form of racial, ethnic supremacism that is congenial to them, that they think can advance and protect their interests. Uh, so, so same with you know uh, uh, many groups in in the United States who yeah. who back Trump because they think of him as essentially the protector of their interests, rightly or wrongly. Uh, so likewise, likewise in India, there are people who might be economically at the bottom end of the spectrum but still invest in the prime minister or still invest in, in an idea of Hindu supremacism because they think this is the only thing that can actually help us survive. Um, at the same time, the, the richest people in the country are also behind him. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't quite neatly you know, break down into economic classes or economic interests. And you know, one of the things that I'm arguing is that actually we have to move beyond this notion of economic self-interest essentially as something that is driving our behavior right now. I think we've gone well, gone well beyond that stage. I think many, many different things are happening. I think uh, there was an article I was reading just the other day, a very interesting one called, it's all disaster nationalism. And in many countries around the world is, is, is that what you see, there's this little sense that disaster is approaching uh, the rhetoric uh, of disaster, the rhetoric of, you know, whether it's words like American carnage or, you know, different different kind of formulations that have emerged. It's a sense that world is falling apart and that we have to take drastic measures to protect ourselves. Uh, so the survivalist instinct has kicked in, in in large, many different parts of the world. Uh, so, you know, I think that traditional sort of mode of analysis where you look at uh, uh, economic stratification, that's still very important, still very relevant, but that doesn't tell you the full story, right? I think there is a new emotional and psychological dynamic out there. Uh, clearly, I mean, and it's interesting. I, I, I wonder if your views on that have somewhat evolved because in one of the essays in Bland Fanatics, one of the early essays, uh, you wrote, as Donald Trump's victory in November, 2016 revealed, the Washington consensus that created too many victims in Washington, D.C.'s own hinterland. I think, I think your initial reaction to Trump that it was is that it was based mostly on economic discontent on voters who felt abandoned by kind of the globalist free trade, you know, uh, neoliberal vision. 
Um, has your thinking on that, is that an accurate kind of description of where you were? Well, really, yeah, and, and there's no way I will ever abandon that, uh, yeah. you know, line of uh, analysis because, you know, that is really the basis in many ways uh, for not just Donald Trump's success, but also the success of uh, his buddy in the UK, Boris Johnson, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that, you know, many people who felt systematically abused uh, by various governments over, over the last few decades decided that this was their man, uh, that you know, he was the one who was gonna break free of the European Union and do all kinds of things that they wanted him to do. Um, and you know, he has to be seen to be obliging these folks, even though he comes from the Tory party, which is traditionally a party of the rich and the right. landed gentry in this class. So I think uh, the, the basic economic drivers uh, were essentially you know, mass discontent, mass disaffection, with the way inequality had entrenched itself in uh, you know, some of the richest societies of the world and that it had become impossible for many people to you know, uh, essentially avail of social mobility. And also um, at the same time, they felt marginalized and scorned by the new cultures that emerged mm -hmm. uh, in the, at, at the same time where you know, their voices were not being heard in the mainstream media. I mean, I think you know, we, we all know that until Trump started to do really well in 2016 as a kind of insurgent candidate, uh, the mainstream media was not paying much attention to what was actually going on in the American hinterland. You know, the, the phrases like the white working class, which have become so commonplace in recent years, were not much being used at the time. You know, phrases mm -hmm. like left behind. It was only a small number of people on the left and the right who were using these phrases, talking about Election. The overall rhetoric, I mean, if you look at Obama, what Obama was writing before Trump's election, a month before Trump's election, he was writing in Wired magazine saying, you know, this is the best time to be alive. We're racing for new frontiers and, you know, it's all working out wonderfully well. Uh, a lot of people really did believe that. Um, and I think, you know, what we've been forced to realize is that actually these forces were, were, were gathering strength. I think where this gets gets kind of to the uh, to the point or the, the sharp edge um, is the question of you know it, it's not just an academic question whether the movement toward a Boris Johnson and Brexit or Trump here is driven primarily by economics or by racial uh, anxieties and, and resentments uh, and also uh, resentments about changing other cultural changes like more acceptance of, of same sex relationships and, and more assertive roles for women in the workplace, because it really gets to the issue of, well, is what can overcome that for the parties of the left? I mean, is there, uh, is there an economic agenda that can win back a substantial portion of the white working class in the Western countries from a right that is now being much more overt about its racism than they have been really, as I said, since Wallace. And you quote, uh, I think it's Enoch Powell, is that it was in the, in the 60s, kind of a Wallace contemporary. Um, do you think there is an economic agenda that can overcome the the, the, the connection that, that Trump and the other right-wing nationalists create by voicing these racial resentments so overtly, um, go back, very fine people, all of that. Is there an economic answer or, or do the parties of the left have to find a way to win around that and essentially concede most of those voters to the right for the foreseeable future? I think there are two different things here. I mean, one are, you know, of course there are, for, first of all, I think the white working class is a, is a I think deeply problematic construct uh, because it already concedes too much to the far right uh, when we start describing or when we start racializing uh, the working classes in, 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 in that way. But although they uh, behave very differently electorally, I mean, you, you, you will have, you know, the, the most of the, much of the working class is black and Hispanic. Yeah. They are not drawn to Trumpian style arguments. Exactly. The white yeah. part of it that is drawn to it. And, yeah. really and I think, you know, um, there is the problem of how do you devise an electoral strategy for, a elect for an electorate uh, that is often racially divided and often too prone to, uh, you know, racial sentiments of the kind that have been provoked uh, recently. And then, of course, uh, in the long term for the left, thing, I think that is the primary challenge, to come up with an economic program uh, that actually is respectful, that is, first of all, acknowledging the enormous damage that has been done, not only to the American economy, our American society, but also the national environment, 
uh, which has become a big factor there. So I feel like what has happened in the last couple of years is that we've seen these two struggles play out simultaneously. One is the attempt by people to the left of Joe Biden in the Democratic Party to set the agenda and to also win essentially political power within the party. In that, they have failed. Mm -hmm. I think that you know, can be easily admitted now, right now that uh, Bernie Sanders actually did not uh, succeed the second time around. It was Joe Biden who won, uh, the supposedly moderate centrist candidate uh, the old wing of the party could agree upon. But at the same time, I still think that Biden, if he does win, uh, will have to respond to at least some part mm -hmm of the left agenda that people like Bernie Sanders and um, AOC and others have, have outlined, that he won't be in, able to entirely ignore them. And you know, of course, then uh, you can kind of think of all kinds of policies and ideas in the abstract. Of course, the actual work of policy making and creating uh, elect and, uh, support behind it in the Congress, these are again, different matters altogether. But, you know, to answer your question uh, slightly differently, I do think the left has made a serious attempt in the last uh, two years to come up with an economic program that acknowledges the damage, the hurt mm -hmm. being done to many, many Americans over the last few uh, decades, and also to address at the same time, um, you know, this, this, this sort of enormous damage that has been done to the, to the natural environment. Not, not to make you into a, you know, uh, James Carville or, uh, or uh, Alistair uh, uh, Campbell, uh, you know, short-term political strategist, but um, do you think, having lived through the Corbyn experience in the UK, do you think the Democrats would be better positioned to build a long-term majority if, in fact, they had gone the Bernie Sanders route this year or the AOC route in the future? Is that... A, a more a, a more expansive democratic socialism. Can they build a, a bigger, more stable majority that way, or through the kind of you know incremental caution of a, of a Biden? You know, uh, I think once when, when 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 you start to sort of think in those terms, then you also have to think more strategically, and and you think in terms of timing, uh, and then you have to ask: Is it good timing for a democratic socialist government to come in right now? in November or then take assume office in, in January. Um, somehow there are ways in which ideas um, can remain dormant for a very long time and then suddenly become very potent. I mean, you know, Corbyn again lost and lost very badly in, uh, in the UK, but many of his ideas, many of the ideas, not just I guess thrown by Jeremy Corbyn, I mean, he was an individual, but there were a lot of people around him. There were a lot of young people supporting him and they threw up ideas, which actually the Tory government has embraced. You know, I think you know that's been something that we've all witnessed with great amusement over the last few months. Or so the way in which Boris Johnson's government has scrambled to embrace large parts, not just embrace hijack large parts of the Labour, Labour Party's program, mm -hmm. and in many cases, you know, this is also what has happened in 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 the United States, where Biden has had to abandon many of his centrist positions and actually move leftwards not just in response to the political pressures from people like Bernie Sanders, but also I think out of a recognition that this is something that is going to have a broad base. You know, we were talking earlier about the changing demography, changing, uh, there's so many different factors which will make that program much, much more appealing and much, much more attractive. And, you know, post pandemic, I think, you know, greater role of the state, broader program for social welfare, uh, th these are not sort of you know options that you might consider in the abstract. These are existential necessities now. Yeah, you 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 are very tough in your writing on the quote third way leaders of the '90s like Clinton and Blair who saw themselves as modernizing the left. Uh, you you cite Tony Jute's description of them and their contemporaries as quote the crappy generation, which is you know I, I believe a technical term of art. Um, what did they get wrong? Uh, they did win after periods in which the right had been in power. I mean, you know, the Thatcherite uh, Tories had been in power for a very long time. In the three elections before Bill Clinton, uh, the Republicans had won a higher share of the available electoral college votes than in any three elections in the history of our modern party system since 1828. So they did kind of put the left back in the ball on the field at least, but what did they get wrong in your view? And what is the lesson of that as we come to another moment, at least in the US where the left may be regaining power? 
what it's well, there's many things wrong. I mean, I think, you know, um, the uh, speaking as a, as a foreigner, I think the, the thing that immediately leaps to mind is the war in Iraq, uh, which mm-hmm. absolutely destroyed uh, Tony Blair. And I think uh, people really underestimate the extent to which it undermined the United States, both domestically and internationally. Um, and, you know, various other policies uh, followed by uh, Bill Clinton, whether it's the, the sort of uh, attempt to create essentially a mass incarceration society back in the 90s, uh, those heavy handed uh, laws against terrorism, all of those, you know, foundations on which people like uh, George W. Bush and Trump have built. Um, so I think, you know, if you start actually listing all the many things they got wrong, um, the, 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 the list is potentially endless and not to mention, you know, whole program of deregulation and, and, and yeah. privatization. Uh, again, that's sort of, you know, short term thinking that I'm going to win this election, I'm going to win the next one, and I'm going to be prime minister for two terms or three terms or president for two terms, uh, but not actually, you know, thinking beyond that. And this is the problem that democracies now have to consider is that the sort of the turnover of individuals and political parties and movements, are they really equipping these societies with the resources that are needed, especially at a time of crisis like this? You know, um, I, I think one of the, to me, one of the most interesting and surprising threads in your writing, whether it's Bland Fanatics or Age of Anger, is that you have a certain amount of sympathy, even while being critical of those who have resisted modern society defined by individualism and acquisitiveness and kind of secularism. Uh, obviously, with starting with Rousseau, who's kind of a hero uh, in the uh, age of anger, and then his German followers in the in the 19th century, even in some respects, Khomeini, you know, as, as an expression of the resistance to this kind of universalizing creed of what a successful society looked like. What does the US, the UK, the West more broadly, if anything, need to learn from that line of thinkers that you outline uh, and, and explore? Well, one one uh, thinker you did not mention who I often quote and have learned a great deal from is uh, Gandhi, yeah. uh, who was uh, among all the people you mentioned, uh, the most you know, influential and the most eloquent critic of many modern uh, political and economic arrangements. And I think the reason for that being that he actually experienced those realities, not just in India, but also in South Africa, in Europe. He was a subject of the British Empire. So his experience was very broad and very deep. And so he was able to see from his unique perspective. And then, of course, he read a lot of Tolstoy, he read a lot of Ruskin, he, read, you know, he combined uh, from all these different readings and, and, and writings of various people, a very coherent critique of just how modern imperialism, modern capitalism had worked itself out, not just in you know, different parts of the world like India, but also domestically in places like England and the United States. So, you know, he was saying back in the 1920s and 30s that uh, what we call democracies are actually built on too much violence and on domination and exploitation. And once, uh, you know, large parts of Asia become free and become economically self-sufficient, then that violence won't work the way it used to in the past. And the societies that are democratic now will become frankly totalitarian. So, you know, here is something that, uh, you know, uh, Indian guy was saying back in the 1920s. Why? Not because he was a genius, but because he was simply experiencing these realities in different parts of the world. And, you know, looking at it, looking at things from the bottom and saying, okay, you know, let's be concerned about the environment. If uh, 300 million Indians, that was the population of India at the time, start to consume in the same way like uh, these you know minority of Europeans and Americans the world would be stripped bare as though it had been in- invaded by locusts so you know this 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 kind of vision that uh, people had and he was not the only one again you know back in the tens or 20s or 30s speaking about these things um, so I think one thing we have utterly failed to do, in our mainstream discourses, and we both belong to the mainstream in, in, you know, in some ways, is to incorporate the experiences and ideas of 
some of these figures. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, we've been kind of running blind. Uh, we haven't actually really thought beyond our own power and influence and how to protect it, how to advance it. In that sense, we become, or let ourselves become intellectually very helpless. And I think that is what many of us feel today is because we have no access to any other ideas apart from the failed ones that are all around us right well, now. You write, you write about how uh, even the most quote unquote progressive Western thinkers uh, have been exposed to very little non-Western political thought. Uh, and that's kind of a, a, a kind of a system-wide uh, blind spot. Um, what, what's the price of that, in your view? Oh, I think we pay a huge price for that kind of ignorance. Um, you know, the fact that today a writer from India or Egypt or Indonesia, if he or she wants to write about global affairs, you've really got to know that person needs to know. Uh, a lot about the Euro-American tradition, philosophies, histories, political histories, religions, before they have any kind of authority or indeed even basic credentials to write about uh, things outside you know, uh, their respective societies. Uh, there is no such requirement on the part of people who pontificate day in and day out about India, about Iran, about Russia, None whatsoever. They don't speak the language. They have not read a single book of, say, you know, Arab philosophy. But yes, you, you, can, you can say whatever the hell you want about, you know, how the Arab thinks or what there's a, there was a famous book during the Iraq war, The Arab Mind. Mm -hmm. So you can pontificate about the Arab mind without ever having read a single book by an Arab writer. Um, so I think what it has done, I mean, the case of Iraq and, and, and the so-called Arab mind, it has been proven pretty uh, devastatingly, just what the effects of that kind of ignorance, arrogance, the mind of arrogance are. Um, and I think, you know, not actually knowing uh, about other worldviews, about other philosophies, you know, to take a simple example, like the Indian worldview, what is the Indian worldview? There are many Indian worldviews, obviously, but there's one thing they share in common, which is that life is not fundamentally seen in terms of a pursuit of happiness. Uh, life is seen as essentially full of a whole lot of suffering and the idea is liberation from that life of suffering. Uh, but if you assume that actually people in India are just dying to be Americans, uh, then you will make serious cognitive intellectual errors in your analysis of that country. This is just a very tiny example that, yeah. I'm, that I'm offering you. Um, it's that sort of you know assumption that uh, we are the best that human civilization is capable of. And everyone else should either follow us or should be forced to imitate us. Mm -hmm. um, that has resulted from this really profound and, 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 and really extraordinarily sad ignorance of other traditions, other, other philosophies, other worldviews. I'm going to bring in the audience in a minute because they have a whole bunch of questions, as you might expect. But I, I, before I do, I want to, I want to ask you about one one other thing. I, you know, in reading through uh, the books, uh, I thought I stumbled across your ideal when you were writing about 19th century German thinkers, I believe, who were searching for a formula where, and here I'm going to quote: "quote Liberty and democracy could be achieved without capitalism." equality without totalitarianism, and spirituality, spirituality and religion without clerical authority. Is that kind of the model you think of a society that would be most successful? And have you seen one that comes close? Uh, we haven't, unfortunately, but I think, you know, it's definitely worth aspiring to, no question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, but there, there, isn't, there isn't something you can point to that has come close to that uh, of what? No, Sally, I think, you know, there are small places, um, obviously at different points in history, different moments in history, they've come close to it. Um, and I think, you know, there have been societies with relatively less degree of violence and coercion and exploitation uh, and where people have felt freer. And I think, you know, geographically because of the lack of centralized uh, control by the state people have been free from also the heavy hand of the state. So there have been moments here and there, but I think um, in terms of the modern world and people, you know, fully fledged members of the modern world, I think we have a long way to go before we come anywhere near that particular idea. Yeah, all right, so let's, let's bring in the audience. Um, what can the entire world learn 
from the example of one of the most, quote, developed countries in the world, presumably the U.S., acting like quote, a third world country, presumably in its level of disorganization? Well, I think uh, what we can learn, I mean, especially for people elsewhere, uh, many of whom sort of saw the United States as a kind of model, as an idea, that we have to be very attentive to our local environment, that we have to be very attentive to our particular societies, their particular circumstances, and not go chasing after uh, elusive foreign ideas. I mean, one of the problems no. of the so-called third world, it is no longer called the third world, but uh, the problem nevertheless persists in different parts of Asia and Africa is that uh, they embarked upon a project of imitation of modernization without taking into account uh, the particular demographic, uh, natural, geographical uh, nature of their societies. And I think that has really been a huge problem in, in you know, sort of failing to break through mm -hmm. certain ideological, self-made, self-created delusions. Um, and I think you know what America at this point offers to the rest of the world is a is a cautionary tale that you were trying to imitate America. Well, actually, you know, America can end up in a very unfortunate place. Are you? Are, this is, I'm, I'm going to follow up with one of my questions. I'm going to ask you later. Uh, are you optimistic or pessimistic about what the next 10, 15 years in America is going to look like? I think you know. I I feel it's it's the situation right now is too complicated to be either any of those things. I mean, on, on, you know, on one side, you see enormous uh, potential in terms of the energy released by political action in, in, uh, in recent years, especially by a younger generation in America. That's been hugely inspiring, you know, someone from the outside looking in uh, to see so many young people come together under different, you know, advancing based causes of social justice. So that's the great source of hope. At the same time, you know that the forces of the status quo are deeply entrenched and they are in positions of power and influence and they will not let go of this enormous power they've accumulated easily. So there's a big struggle to be had there. And, you know, again, I mean, I think uh, probably we'll witness that struggle for, the, for, for at least the rest of my lifetime. Um, I and you know, one important ingredient, I think, uh, going forward would be certainly a degree of optimism and hope. I think without that, everything is lost, really. Yeah, I think the 2020s in America are gonna be the 1850s, where you have a rising majority whose agenda is being stalemated by a minority that controls a lot of the key institutions. And uh, you know, whether it was the Dred Scott decision from the Supreme Court in 1857 on slavery or what, what's gonna be coming, when if Democrats win and end the filibuster and pass a new voting rights act and the court strikes it down again, it's just going to be a very rocky uh, a decade. And you know, there's something absolutely, and there is something which wasn't there in the 1850s, which is a very competitive international sphere, right? Where various powers have emerged and are going to be strengthening themselves even more in the next decade. And, and a perfect segue into the next question I wanted to ask you is what, if what is happening right now is a rebalancing of world powers, which countries are coming out ahead? One of the viewers. Well, I think um, East Asia on the whole, uh, and you know, also in the way they've dealt, that region has dealt with the uh, pandemic and its uh, after effects. Uh, East Asia on the whole has emerged much, much stronger uh, from the recent uh, chaos. Um, I don't know whether it's, you know, I think, I, 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 I really don't believe in this vision of one country prospering at the cost of other countries. I think it is possible actually for, for, for many countries to flourish simultaneously. I think the important thing is to give up this mindset uh, whereby one country can only do well if other country does badly. Um, and actually that is one source of conflict today and, and, and much paranoia and prejudice today. Um, but on the whole, I think, you know, uh, East Asian countries have done remarkably well in responding to the pandemic. And actually right now, I think it's your success in responding to the pandemic that is being registered. Um, mm -hmm. You know, economies are all on the on in in, in a sort of you know uh, in a in a 
in stasis right now. There's not much happening there. Uh, of course, I mean, China has restarted and it's doing much better, but I think we still have to wait and see. But the fact it has actually managed to contain it relatively uh, successfully and that it is even able to open many of its industries is a sign that it is actually emerging stronger from this. One of the questions was China and, and the balance that it, that, it, that it strikes between a growing and very consumption-based middle, middle class uh, and, um, uh, you know, obviously all the other issues that raises that you talked about, Gandhi talking about the environmental implications of India, certainly uh, relevant in China. I mean, it, do, you, do you see China mostly as a force for, I don't want to say good in the world, but, but, but it bringing more stability to the world or instability? I think that very much depends, actually. It's not up to China, really, in mm. that sense, to either promote stability or instability. A, a great deal depends on how the rest of the world responds to China. Uh, what kind of uh, playing field is, in, in a way, uh, exists? What kind of playing field exists for China today? I mean, I think in the past, what we've seen is, with Japan rising, starting the early 20th century, uh, the country found itself blocked on all different sides and uh, as a result became even more and more militaristic and xenophobic. Um, and I think, you know, a large part of its behavior, uh, this, this sort of nasty imperialism that it resorted to um, mm -hmm. and kind of, you know, crushing down whatever seeds of democracy that existed within the country was actually as a result of this, this sort of siege mentality that it developed, that you know, there are enemies all around it that are uh, preventing its growth and that we have to break out. And finally, you know, they broke out in that sort of suicidal way. So I don't think it's entirely up to China mm. to really make the world either a better place or a worse place. I think a lot of us must also share that responsibility. One of, the, one of the viewers writes, uh, you are insightful on the damage done by economic policies of neoliberalism, which need to be addressed. Are there also cultural damages from these policies in the past decades that also need to be addressed? Well, I think, um, you know, on the whole, and again, you know, I have to be self-critical here, uh, that we uh, writers and journalists for the mainstream press have been too self-absorbed uh, we've been far too self-congratulatory, um, not really perceptive enough of the sufferings and ordeals of ordinary people, mm. and actually have managed to project the impression that there is this, you know, unaccountable elite that doesn't really care about ordinary people, and not only doesn't care about them, but actually, you know, scorns them. Uh, looks down on them. Uh, and, you know, I know a lot of people suffer from that sort of perception uh, that they are being marginalized, they're being scorned. And I really do think there's some truth in that perception, mm -hmm. um, that the culture at large, intellectual culture, political culture, has been condescending to large members of, of, uh, of, of, of the population, large section of the population. You know, and, 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 and there's a perfect follow-up question from, from one of the uh, viewers. So let me ask that, and I will ask the follow-up that I had to that. Uh, in the USA, but also elsewhere, there seems to be a level of hubris that mirrors a discontent that it tries not to acknowledge. Uh, how can we encourage humility, presumably among our leaders, and maybe begin to find some ways to alleviate the discontent? I mean, is it is it just kind of, I see you, I acknowledge, I mean, certainly Biden, I saw him this week in Michigan. He said, look, we, we lost sight of you. Uh, uh, you know, um, is that the first step? Oh, absolutely. I think for, for um, you know, any politician right now who is seeking to uh, benefit at this point from this implosion that we see in Trump land mm -hmm. uh, is that arrogance, hubris have in a way reached a kind of monstrous culmination, you know, with those images of Trump uh, on the White House balcony taking off his mask. And I think now is the time for humility. So in a way, humility has a new opportunity right now to make itself manifest um, in the way politicians speak, in the way they address, uh, you know, large uh, mem numbers of the electorate. Um, so, you know, I, I, you know, as a political strategy, it makes complete sense at this point. Mm -hmm.
You know, I, 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 here's what I was going to say. I mean, I think when Trump got elected, I think the dominant impulse on, on left of center Americans was like, wow, things must be really tough in a lot of these communities and they're willing to go to the extreme of electing Donald Trump. I think that's changed though over time because as he has been so horrible, so openly racist and sexist, and authoritarian and extorting the government of Ukraine, I think that the mood has more changed to not what were the conditions that led people to support him, but what is wrong with these people if they are still with him? Like, doesn't it say something about them if he can be this openly racist and they're still willing to vote for him. And I do wonder if there is a diminishment of the sympathy for the economic struggles of kind of Trump country, America, uh, because uh, they, they are willing to abide what in the rest of America seems clearly indefensible. Well, there could be that. I mean, I think definitely, um, absolutely, if you feel that 40% of the people are still gonna vote for him, uh, you, you will probably feel that. But at the same time, I think there's another way of looking at it, which is to register the sheer desperation of people uh, who are still voting for Trump at yeah. this point, you know, uh, that perhaps it has something to do with the fact that real political choice is not being offered right now mm -hmm. in this election. Um, so there is that possibility also to be considered. I asked you this question about America, we're, we're, you know, we're in our last few minutes. I would love to get your feeling. Is the 2020 is gonna be a good decade or a bad decade for the world in your view? Well, at this point, um, <laughs> it's, <laughs> It's probably too early to tell, is it? Right, right, right. Only just started. It sounds like Joe Lai on the French Revolution. Yes, but yes. the future is becoming difficult to predict too. I mean, it should remain difficult to predict actually, mm -hmm. ideally. And is it because you think it is not clear which of the, I mean, if you, you know, do you think the kind of the, the, the right wing nationalism wave has peaked? Yeah, I think in some ways, yes. I mean, by, by some ways, I mean, in some contexts, in some countries, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. But what do we mean by peaking? I mean, that's another question, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, losing elections doesn't mean that you started on a, you know, downward trend. I think right. um, because after losing an election, and this has happened in other countries too, is that uh, the democratic process is then replaced by all kinds of you know intense conflicts that actually don't have a democratic format whatsoever right. and that take place out in the open um, and mm -hmm. are often extremely violent so that is something we have to worry about at this point you know, i think that is a really right is not a organization or an outfit or a movement that is going to remain confined and controlled by democratic norms and democratic institutions. I mean, that is very clear right now. I think that is a really important point because I, I believe Trump's fundamental message to his supporters is that I am the human wall between these contemptuous elites and these dangerous minorities who are taking away your country. And I'm not sure why him losing would reduce the fear among the voters who respond to that. I think if anything, you know, I often say if, if, if white Christians are now 43% of America, non-college whites are probably around 42, 43% of America. If this many of them are responsive to Trump when they're 43% of America, why are they gonna be less responsive when they're 38, which is coming? And you know, I'm sure that the equivalent is true, is true elsewhere. Well, we're we're almost at, we're almost out of time. You've been very generous uh, with your time. Can I ask you uh, just uh, as a final note, uh, where what, have you been to Los Angeles, and what did you think of it? Oh, many times. Um, I actually quite love it. I mean, I know people love to hate it, uh, but I love to love it. Um, there are many many parts of the cities um, that I explored at you know great lengths and with ample freedom, particularly, you know, the bookstores, many of the good bookstores have gone, sadly, yes. uh, from Venice and Santa Monica. But, you know, I just remember, I have very fond memories of, of going to them. And of course, of, you know, Venice Beach and Santa Monica, I, I realize I'm actually, you know, talking about the nicer parts of LA, but also actually downtown LA is a fascinating place. Um, and last time I was there, I actually loved walking around it. Um, and um, do you do you find I, one thing I you did not write a huge amount in what I've read uh, is do you find American is American culture kind of cultural imperialism or a lot of fun or both? I think it can be both. Um, I mean, you know, the fact that American culture has been embraced voluntarily by large parts of the world. I mean, you know, especially yeah. 
African American culture, uh, which is in a way the biggest American cultural export. Uh, yeah. The movies, I mean, that is really the biggest thing. And I think it's because it speaks to many people. I mean, and that is, you know, something that is about suffering, it's about justice, about so many things that resonate with people around the world. Uh, so you don't really see that as part of American cultural imperialism, you know, like BLM, for instance, it provoked such international solidarity because people are already primed to receive that message mm. by decades and decades of listening to Stevie Wonder and, and, and uh, Nina Simone. I mean, you know, this is, this is a legacy of those people that people are around the world are so responsive immediately to yeah. something that happens in the United States. Well, we're going to have to close here for today. Uh, thank you all for listening. Pankaj, thank you so much for your time and your insight. Okay. And uh, it was a lot of fun as well. Thank you again to Noema Magazine for co-presenting this discussion, which will remain publicly available on Zocalo's website and podcast. Thank you again. Thank you all for watching. I hope you'll be back for another conversation and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Rob. Thank you.